So as our planning committee put together the, the topics for this conference, one of the things that we wanted there we felt was a big part of the story was technology. Technologies that might be coming to us, what technologies are, are on the forefront, but we also wanted to give you some perspective on how ranching operations should approach maybe adopting, leveraging, and, and utilizing technologies. And we were very fortunate to uh, be able to call on what I would call a, a very, you know, deep industry in, in southwest Kansas, Kansas, and the nation, um, and, and having Dr. Mark Gardner, or Mr. Mark Gardner come, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, you know, agreed to speak at this, this conference. Uh, Mark is a part of our family here at K-State, graduated with his bachelor's degree in animal science in, in our department. Um, he assumed the reins of that operation in, in early 2000, uh, and uh, under Mark's direction, um, they've probably developed one of the largest embryo transfer programs, um, certainly in the country, and, and maybe if not in the world. Um, they've doubled the size of the ranch, uh, and just really been what I would call fictional with Kansas and, and at large. Uh, you know, sponsoring, uh, you know, a lot of community involvements, the Henry C. Gardner Global Lecture, lecture Series. Um, his wife, Eva, they also have two sons that have returned to the operation. Uh, another son is currently here at K-State, uh, and those would be the fifth generation uh, at operation uh, down in Ashland, Kansas. And so without further ado, if we get the technology kind of pulled up, it's going to be my pleasure to uh, welcome Mark Gardner uh, to the podium. Um, and he's going to be discussing pursuing and adopting and leveraging technology. That's working. Well, good morning, everybody. It's exciting to be back at Kansas State University. And Justin, thank you so much for that introduction. And oftentimes I give talks and we talk about various things like ultrasound and repro, and they go, are you a veterinarian? It's coming. No, I'm not. But I slept with one last night, and that's Dr. Eva Gardner. And she's my best friend, and we're excited to be here. And I walked in today, and the band was playing. And I come back to this place, and I'm like, this is the Mecca. This is where it happens, and this is where information, and this is where connections happen. Is it an exciting place because of Weber Hall? Is it an exciting place because of everything on campus? No. It's the people. It's the people of Kansas State University. And I have to make one small correction on my third son. Uh, Larry, I'm, I'm confessing here. My son's dream was to run for Kansas And they wanted him, but they didn't have a spot from him. So uh, we're trying to help our people down the river learn a little bit. But the University of Kansas uh, wanted Quanta to run. And so Quanta runs for Kansas. And, uh, we have 15 degrees from Kansas State University as we go for number 16. So that being said, I'm excited to be here today. And I called my friends. I looked at the title of this, Pursuing, Adopting, and Leveraging Technology. What's that mean? You know, what, what does that mean? So and then I looked at the program, and I look at all these things, and this was the, what they told me to talk about. Issues concerning maintaining profitability through weather, market, and ongoing challenges for beef producers. I think that could even be catastrophes that I'm supposed to touch on. Come on, man! Do I look like a college professor? You know, we're going to try to connect the dots. And I grind on my kids ever since they were born about connecting the dots. And I'm going to refer to Uncle Larry over here many times because he's one of the guys that raised me. But we've got to connect the dots. And we can have all these formulas and it can be awesome. But if you don't make those things fit together and make it work out in this college classroom, you cannot convert that cellulose into the greatest tasting protein in the world. And one of the things that I so appreciate about Kansas State University is we can do this and we can figure it out. So I looked a little bit more and, and, and Justin mentioned the ranch and, and we have a large ranch because there's a lot of us out there. We had to grow the business, but uh, we run a lot of cattle. Uh, we have four sales a year, but that's not what you asked me to talk about. But that's a little background. We live in southwest Kansas and uh, usually doesn't rain, and I'm glad to see the Manhattan's gotten some rain, but since May, we've been very good too. But our business philosophy 
It's to produce the right product. Okay? And oftentimes, and I see some of my seed stock colleagues in here, and I wouldn't pick on anybody or name anybody Matt, but our job is to help our customers reach their goals. What are their goals? Well, it's a little bit like Evan said. It's to be profitable. Because this is a great way of life. This is a great place to raise our, our kids and, and teach them work ethic. So I have to understand and I have to work to be able to produce the round, right pounds and the right package in the environment that they choose to work in. So our job is to help our customers make money. And how can I help them make money if I don't understand? We got some of the great economy economists here today in the crowd and they're going to tell you a lot more than I can but I got to understand the nuts and bolts of what makes money so let's let's go about and say how do we add value to our customers cattle now I'm going to digress just a little bit and I'm I'm really disappointed he's not here so I need to to review this but Dr. Tom Field the University of Nebraska at Lincoln Nebraska is he here all right, here we go, buddy. I was going to memorize this, but I can't. It's too... The director of the Engler Agribusiness Entrepreneurship Program and the Paul Engler Chair of Agribusiness Entrepreneurship at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. This guy is stout, and I've already showed you this picture. There he is. It's Tom Field. And I saw where he's going to talk about technology disruption. Tom, I had to look it up. I'm going, so did I. okay. <laughs> so I looked it up, and this is what, what it said. Technology disruption is the process whereby a small company with few resources. You guys are ranchers. We understand that we have few resources, but few resources successfully challenges a larger establishment, incumbent business, or invents entirely new markets. You guys are cattlemen. You guys are agriculturalists. I mean, we've been disrupting things for centuries to survive. So, Tom, I gotta admit, I'm kinda scared. I've never had such a big dog like you in the audience here. I mean, that is a title now, you know. And don't you, aren't you excited to be where people wear purple? <laughs> it's a pretty good place. Nebraska is too. <laughs> Nebraska is a good place too. So we're going to go back 20 some years and talk about a disruptive technology. And it was a Weber Hall not very long ago and with that time some of the U.S. premium beef guys in here, we were on what we called the Blue Sky Tour. And I will never forget this, we had them wound up and we were talking about what we were going to do and this and that and one of my major professors at Kansas State University said, it's a nice thought. It's a nice mental exercise. It will never happen. Well, I see a lot of youth out here, and that's what we had going for us. If you can imagine, I was 35 years old, and we didn't know any better. We didn't know that we couldn't do this, so we did it. So let's talk a little bit about U.S. Premium Beef, and why was that formed? And why, why did we go about doing that? And, and some of the kids that have had to endure me in classes, why is that bull purple on U.S. Premium Beef's logo? We're bullish on beef, you know, royal value. I know a spot that I love full well. Why did we get together? We were students from Kansas State University that knew each other and we were scared to frickin' death. I'm going, I got two little kids. I chose to be a cattleman, an agriculturalist. And Dr. Harlan Ritchie had written this talk, so five years to meltdown. What did he mean? He meant that the rate we were losing market share in the beef industry, in five years we wouldn't be a relevant protein. And I won't talk about Henry as much today, but I said to my dad, Henry, I go, is that possible? He said, oh yeah. I said, oh my God. So that being said, what we did, all of those people from Kansas State that knew each other, that was the interim board to start with, can delete those rights or you have to deliver one animal each year to your packing plant. 
You come to K-State and hear about a packing plant. What a deal, Tracy. How are we going to get the right cattle? How are we going to make more money? You know, Larry, they sent me in there to negotiate the very first grid. I go, Hunter, what do I know about negotiating the grid? Well, you've got carcass data on You used to go get carcass data, so you should know. So I go in there and I go, M -m 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 Mr. Miller, I'm 35 years old, I'm scared, and the evil packer's right there in front of me. <laughs> he says, okay, what do we need to do? I said, M -m -m Mr. Miller, w w what makes us the most money? Well, that's easy. That's the high quality. That's the, that's the prime. That's the certified Angus beef. I said, okay, well, we need to design a grid that will pull those cattle through. You can't push them through. You have to hold up the dollar bill. You guys aren't dumb. You'll figure it out if we hold up the dollar bills. And so, careful. National beef, which is what U.S. Premium became a partner in, they were, they were the ones with the Angus heifer up on the, they were the quality packer. You know what their average choice was in 1996, Larry? You're very kind. It was 40. So, I says, well, we got to be careful. If we get too many of those kind of cattle, they become commodity cattle. And so by then, Matt, I got my air back and I said, well, quit being a meathead. We have to grow demand. And when you look at, when the economists talk later today, I think the world over. Through and let's go about how do you how do you pull these right cattle through and so I'm going to take you through the U.S. premium beef grid as it stands today it's the price choice prime choice spread four week rolling average everything's a four week rolling average slower up slower down certified Angus beef is above choice uh, Black Canyon is the upper part of the small marbling grade okay uh, you know the threshold plant threshold of 60 percent choice or higher you know Absence of discounts is often the best premium. So if you come under 50% choice, you're going, to get, you're going to get penalized, deducted, that choice select spread. Yield grade, what's the target? The target's three. If you bring yield grade ones, there's going to be a bonus for that. Same for twos. You're going to get penalized for fours and fives. You know, which would we rather have, a, a heavyweight carcass or a lightweight carcass? I see the governor in the back of the room. Which one? Where are you, governor? We would rather have a heavy one or a light one? Yeah, Callahan, come on. We have different results yesterday. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of upset about that. Okay. <laughs> he knows the answer, but would you, I mean, you don't want him to break the chains, okay? But it costs the same to run a 1,000 pound carcass through the plant as it does to, to run a 585 pounder through there. So let's go through this and, you know, I hear various things about myself and things. And when I, this started, a lot of my K-State friends would say, Gardner, it's just another damned old Angus deal. I said, well, I hope it is. I need to know what our cattle can do. And if our cattle aren't good enough, we've got to get better. And so how can you know if you don't measure them, if you don't ever gather that information on them? If we can gather that data and gather that information, we have those shares and have a total amount. Our customers use a lot of those shares um, as a customer service. And the whole philosophy and the whole point here is if I can, you know, I learned this at Kansas State University. If I can help my customers make money, I get to stay in business too. So everything we do, we come about it as how, how can we make this relationship to help you be more profitable? Well, U.S. Premium Beef has done this. Now, I took this grid from exactly a year ago. The prices are very similar except for prime. Uh, but this is 372 head of cattle. Uh, and you'll look at uh, you know, my pointer doesn't. Yeah, it does. Okay, the, the base price was, was $1.16, and we have uh, plus 25 cents for the base price. But we're going to go through that. Choice is, is similar today. Prime is about 12.52, which I had other grids, but I, I wanted to illustrate the maximum on prime and we'll talk we can just divide by three to get that because it's 1252 today on today's grid but here we're 372 cattle uh, in the panhandle of texas here just last uh, a year ago right now they were 99 plus percent choice obviously uh 26 percent prime and if you look at most plant averages uh three four five percent prime on a plant average basis 
when we started U.S. premium beef, national and most of the others were kind of one to two percent prime. And, and, you know, and sometimes people think that prime is unachievable, but I'm going to show you some data. I mean, think about carcass traits. Think about the heritabilities of those. It's 0.4 heritable. And we can talk about all the various things, but I will suggest to you this, marbling is free. And those in my line of work that want to say that uh, it's not maternal, I say show me the data. The correlation between marbly and reproductive efficient is like 0.003. So it's flat. So if, if you're having repro problems, we can think about different this and that, but it's not because of marbling. So let's go through this and let, let's just go through and look at the grid. Uh, let's look at a prime carcass. Uh, you're going to get the choice select spread, which at that time was 1078. It's pretty similar to that right now. Uh, at that time it was 3194. Right now it's 1252. So you look at that you get on this, this set of cattle, but there's $42 a hundredweight more because of these prime cattle. Okay, so let's go through and let's look at certified Angus beef. You know, at that time, I mean, the base on CAB is $3. It's a little bit above that today, but $3 works. But for each and every one you bring, it's three bucks. So you're getting 13 cents, 14 cents a pound for each and every one you bring to the plant. So you go, well, how does this all, all affect me? Let's just go through and how do we, how does this, I mean, I sell my calves at weaning. That's great. Just realize that there's a report card on those calves. So let's go through and let's just look at an individual calf and why this could or should ma matter to you. And as we think about how we're going to proceed and how we're going to add more value back to the ranch, you know, I work with our customers a lot and suggest your nutrition program, your herd health, your genetics, all those things together. Why not partner with yourself? You know, I like partnering with me, okay? So if you can do that, and, and really there's some feedlot folks here today, you can do that. I mean, there's not a feedlot in Kansas that won't partner with you, won't finance you. So, so consider some of these things. But let's just look at one steer. Let's go through, and we have to look at the opportunity cost. So when these cattle went on feed, uh, their base price, 810 pounds, $1,134 per head, or $1.40, you know, when those calves would have sold. Those cattle were fed at a 67 cent cost of gain, 547 pounds, so that cost 365, 366 bucks to, to feed those cattle. So our break even is $1,500 on those cattle on the live market, cash market. So let's put them in the feed yard and let's just look at that. You know, 1,357 pound live weight, cash market, $1.1647, that's $15.80. So we had $80 more, and you're going to have markets up and down, and so, but you're not always going to have, a because of that appreciation, an $80. But in general, I mean, that wasn't that whippy a market, Larry, at a, at a buck 15 or whatever. So um, if you put those pounds on efficiently, there's opportunity there. So let's take that through on a Choice Plus 863 pound carcass, and let's run it through. I'm biased, but as I like to tell Tracy, I'm right. Let's put it through the very best value added grid for high quality cattle in the beef business today. So let's take that and let's sell it on the US premium beef grid and let's look at that and look at the base price. It's essentially the same. Remember, we put 25 cents on the Western Kansas weighted average, so that's a little different there. Because of the choice cattle there, $93 more for each and every head. Okay, absence of discounts is often a good premium, but there were, there were no outs, there were no yield grade weight or weight discounts, no heavies, lights, no yield grade fours above the threshold. Uh, you know, the, the value added branded program, CAB, that adds another $26. So there's $1,702 because we knew what those cattle would do. I see Dr. Rolf in the room, do genetics work? You're darn right they do. They're highly heritable and they work well. And so if you know your genetics, there's another 122 bucks there for those cattle because they're, they're quality grade and their ability to grade choice. It's another $202. Could, would, can you make it better if you can make another $202? You know, there's a lot of heroes of mine in this room, but my biggest hero was, was Henry Gardner. And he always said, if we can do it with one, we can do it with all of them. So let's make them private choice. Matt, 
Okay, and if you want to criticize me, say, okay, that's a year old and it was $31 prime. Okay, divide that by three. Is there still some money there at $12.52 today? Absolutely. If I can do it with one, I can do it with all of them. So, again, no weight or yield grade discounts. So, we look at this and there's another 372 bucks there because of that quality grade. $452 for each one of the primes that you brought above your base price. That's real money. That is real money. So how do you capture the value? Okay, These are choices. If you want to sell them as a feeder calf, and I'm not criticizing that, we buy lots of customer calves and we feed them. I actually, I'm a terrible buyer because when you're dealing with your customers, I take the top of the market and I put five bucks on it. Because Gary, if I can't give them 30 bucks for their 600 pound calf, knowing that I have a hundred dollar genetic hedge there in those cattle, now the exact same cattle over here that look the same over here, I won't bid on them. But that being said, if you choose to sell those cattle at the, the let's say the feeder calf level or even the calf level, you might be leaving some money on the table. And I would suggest from 80 to 452 dollars. Or, if you choose to sell on the, the generic live market, there's nothing wrong with that. I appreciate that and understand that, but that's, a lot of people do that because they don't know. You can be leaving on the table. At Kansas State University, I learned if you can make a little more, if you invest in yourself, if you put more skin in the game, you can leave nothing on the table. Now, my critics will say, you can, you can have all the loss, too. You can have all the risks. They do die. That's what we have veterinarians for, okay? That's on you. It couldn't be my fault. I love those cattle. My God, I love them, okay? So these things are there today. They've been there for 20 years, and they're getting better and better, and, and I know there's going to be some discussion about them that, but what does the United States of America do better than anybody else in the world? You always know the answer. <laughs> we raise the highest quality, safest beef in the world. Be proud of it. Be a part of it. So I'm here to suggest to you today, it's all really, really good. Even in the worst of times, you can do things and add value to your bottom line. So I, I put up that slide recently with 372 head. I thought that was a big pin, Larry. And they said, well, that's just one pin of cattle. And that was 12. and made that comment to me. And Henry taught me a lot of things, but let's write it down. Let's measure it. Let's track it. So I've been tracking it for the last 12 months of all the, of the cattle that we've been associated with. There's 848 head there of Gardner Angus Ranch steers that we have fed all the way through. Uh, you can read as well as I can. But the bottom line is they're, they're worth $8 a hundred weight above the base market. Okay, yeah, those are, those are this and that. Those are your home-raised cattle. They're all AI, et cetera. Well, here's 4,100 head of customer cattle that we were affiliated with. There's kind of a trend there that they're worth more money because of their genetics. Another $7.36 a hundred. So you put this across the bottom line and you look at nearly 5,000 head of cattle nearly $7 a hundredweight above the base price, that's 5,000 head of cattle. If I can do it with one, I can do it with all of them, okay? Show me the money. You know, that's nearly, that's 98 bucks per each and every head above the base price because of what those cattle were designed to do genetically. Okay, you guys are sitting out there, I can see it in your eyes, okay, the seed stock guy's going off and the genetics, you know, we are the world, all this and that. But it's not that hard and it's highly, highly heritable. And I'm not gonna tell you what genetics fits your land, you have gotta tell me that, okay? But you can partake in this and you can have value added. And you say, oh, I, I got an Angus bull, I got a Hereford bull, whatever it was, I got a Gelby balancer bull, Callahan, it's all good. Get a bull with genetic predictions that add value to the business of beef, okay? Okay, so that nice mental exercise at Kansas State University, we've been doing this since uh, 1997 and we've tracked it. If I can make my customers more, I have a better chance to stay in business. So 92,000 head of Gardner cattle, 
and Gardner customer cattle that have gone through there through U.S. premium beef have made $94 a head above the base the last 20 years or $8.6 million. So, Larry, I, I hate to keep picking on you, but God, I love you. So. do that. It's a nice mental exercise, but you can't do that. So what have we done in the last 20 years? 15 million head of cattle delivered. Five, four million in patronage payments. We will go over 1 billion, 1 billion with a B in distributions from our, our business later this year. It's a hell of a mental exercise that worked extremely well because of the people. And because we weren't afraid of failure. Steve Hunt used to say oftentimes failure is not an option. And, you know, back in the day we were, we were really proud of that grid that we negotiated when we came out of there. <laughs> we'll take the best and we'll let Bob have the rest. And many of you knew who Bob was, as in Bob Peterson from IBP. Bob taught us kids a lot of other lessons. <laughs> I mean, he really did. But when we did that, when we put that prime and that certified Angus beef into the grid, whether you liked this or not, everybody else had to too. And so we didn't know what we had. So the other packers did that too. So let's go to a new or an older disruptive technology. Here's my hero again. And that was our, our main breed, that was our best breeding facility. I mean, I don't know if Twig's here, but we used to milk cows and Larry was there to do that. We did all kinds of cool research with K-State. That barrel's still there and it's, it's about the best desk we have. But back in the day when Henry came to school and, and AI was new in the 50s, that was a disruptive technology. Why would you take all that away from the bull? I mean, that's not natural. I'm not even sure if we should have open AI. Oh, that's a whole different discussion. That was our computer right there. We wrote it down, and we still write it down. I'm, I'm getting frosty haired now, and the kids, well, we just put, no, no, you're going to write it down, too, because I've seen it be misentered before. We're going to write it down, and we're going to write it down in two places, and we're going to put it in the computer. But we manage what we measure, what we keep track of. So because of this technology, Dad made the decision in 1964 to become total AI with no cleanables. So we haven't bred a cow in 54 years. And some of you are going to be tired of this joke, but I, I like it because I remember it. 1972, he said at the supper table, he said, um, sold a bull today. Now, Callahan, I love picking on you because you're a good young man, but I thought I was pretty observant. And I said, what's a bull do? And remember your environment. I was three years old in 1964. Was it up there or what? <laughs> and Dad explained the birds and the bees, and, and I've been trying to observe ever since. <laughs> so this is our ninth. Johnson and them, and they were saying. You know, if you're going to take all this computer stuff, they're going to try to make you a program. You don't want to do that. And so I didn't take any. And then, you know, for the next 20 years, I mean, Ernie, you talked about 1983, August 18th, well, May of 1983, you know. But I didn't think I'd ever be on a computer, let alone, you know. I mean, for the last 20 years, in all reality, it's a big part of all of our lives. So you have to embrace that technology. And I couldn't, I literally couldn't turn on a computer, but we still write it down. So I'm supposed to, and I promise I'm getting to it. And one of the great lessons I learned was at K-State just a couple of years ago. Because when I went home, I was Mark Smart Gardner. I was going to do all these things, and it was going to be, oh, I'm, but I'm shy. I'm quiet. I'm an introvert. I understand the cattle. I'm for you today, thanks to Bill Abel and Dennis Sigler and judging teams, and because Henry said, you're going to give the talk. I'm not going to give the talk anymore. You go give the talk. I go, me? But that being said, all I ever wanted to do, Larry, was to be with cattle. I love cattle. I understand cattle. But what I learned a couple years ago was 
And I have never forgotten this, and I should have known it before. Every animal is connected to a human. And if we are not in the people business, I don't care if you're teaching students at Kansas State or you're weird. That is the opportunity that we can all embrace. And so, no man is an island, and I'm certainly not an island, and, and so surround yourself with a team. You know, those guys at U.S. Premium Beef, we all make a relationship with your manager and talk on a daily basis, you might want to reevaluate that. This is the president of our bank, but our main loan officer, and we make decisions together almost on a daily basis. Okay, he team. And when you think about team members, when I'm supposed to learn what makes money, you know, why does the banker know about as much about genetic predictions as anybody I know? Why does he know about the value added of an embryo transfer cap? He's invested in our business to understand it. A lot of you know this guy. And he's the one about that vet, because we're usually, a lot of times, we're together. And he's like, oh, God, there he goes again. But I did sleep with a veterinarian last night, and she's a great veterinarian. But this is one of my best friends in the world, Dr. Randall Spare. And we've been through many an opportunity together, many a wreck together. And we usually, we talk one way or another every day. And when the opportunity comes about, I go, well, was that your fault or my fault? And we answer simultaneously, it was our fault, okay? So now let's go fix it. But Dr. Spare is invested in our business. He and I are going to give a talk later on uh, at the bovine practitioner meeting about being an entrepreneur. And come along, you can do this too. You know, he's not, no offense to those, I mean, he lances abscesses too, but he does more than lance the abscess. He'll fix things and he'll say, hey, did you ever think about this? We maybe could, could do this. The commercial genetic prediction system. Today, they are the third or fourth largest DNA gathering company in the world. And we benchmark with our commercial customers. I've always struggled, Matt. I love picking on Matt because he's my buddy. These are good for me. Why wouldn't they be good for commercial producers? These are the first in the world to put genetic predictions together for commercial producers. And we do like the dairy industry in that we benchmark with our commercial customers. They, they can look at those, that information and come to us and it, it's And I used to stop them, whoa, we're talking about cattle? Because it was high finance and it was EBITDA. Hunter, what's EBITDA? Could you explain that to me? And so you go through all this high finance and do all that. But <clears throat> I mean, I told him, I said, as we were all getting, you remember, doctor, you know, when we were getting ready to write those checks, I said, OK, Hunter, it's just you and me, you and me. Can we really do this? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can do it. And so we went through quite a few different things, and there were some things that happened, and, and he was maybe head. I had any benefit or not. I told Steve one time when he was getting ready to head down the road, and I said, tell you what, old boy, I'll go with you into hell, and I'll fight whatever you want to do. But I'm kind of scared to go there by myself, okay? So being in a foxhole with people that you know and trust, no matter what are going to be there, Oh, you, you think you have all these things, and you think, think about it, and I go, dang it, I'm over the emotion. And the emotion is not about the stuff that was lost. The emotion is about what you people, what the world, what agriculture did. And it's not the stuff you lose. But look what happened the next day, the next year, continues to this day. People kept, I mean, this, this guy here, and sitting in the middle, he, the guys with the a aprons, they were, they were chuck whacked for you. I'm like, what am I going to do with a cook? Well, all these volunteers that came, they came and they stayed for 10 days. They served over 1,000 people. We would have lunch and, and dinner at our barn every day. I mean, who thinks of that kind of stuff? I mean, how giving is that? You know, these, I'm proud of these people. You see some power cats in there. 
You know, we lost 7,000 big bales of hay. My K-State buddy said, well, Gardner, you should have had it spread out. I said, well, I had it spread out over 30 miles. Do you think that was enough? <laughs> yeah, you might have a point there. The next morning, these are our customers. Relationships, skin in the game, and the opportunity to leave this place better than we found it. The Kansas State way, the American way, is to leave this place better than we found it. We can do it. Thank you very much.